The next speaker is actually Pilar Fernandez, uh, who will speak on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, human tick interactions in anthropogenic landscapes, coupled social and ecological consequences of habitat fragmentation. Well, my name is uh, Maria del Pilar Fernandez. It's my whole name. I go by Pilar Fernandez. Um, I'm going to speak next to the microphone. So my talk is about human tick interactions in anthropogenic landscapes. That means in our urban and suburban areas. Um, and my advisor for this project is Maria Diocuaser. So first, I want to give you a brief introduction on what I work on. I'm a disease ecologist. I work on vector-borne diseases. And these diseases are uh, transmitted by different arthropods that could be, for example, here I show a couple of them. But mostly, like the most common ones and the most uh, famous ones are mosquito-borne diseases. Uh, but also, we are talking about tick transmitted diseases, and this is Tiatoma infestans, which you probably don't know it, but it transmits uh, Chagas disease, which is a very common disease in Latin America. So these diseases, what they have in common is that their transmission, uh, they involve different uh, determinants and different aspects that can be divided in different dimensions. So you have the ecological factors, which has to do with the density and distribution and their interaction of uh, the vectors and the hosts. The host could be any uh, animal that can be infected, or in, and that includes human as well. And then you have the biological factors we have to do with the characteristics of their life cycles, the duration of their life cycles, and other traits such as their infectivity, for example. And on the other side, we're talking about the socioeconomical factors and other psychological, cultural, and political factors, those are um, included in the human dimension of the disease. So there are many uh, determinants that will play a role on how people or different animals in, uh, also get in contact with the vectors and they um, participate in the transmission dynamics. So usually these um, factors are studied independently. And what usually happens is that some of the studies just look at the ecologic, ecological factors, some other studies look at the socioeconomical factors, and sometimes they cross path, but they never, they're never seen, um, or they, they're very, very few studies that take into account many of their aspects and how these aspects are interrelated. For example, how socioeconomical factors determine ecological factors and vice versa. So there are two different approaches that have been um, lately that have been developed uh, in the last um, ten years, in last yeah ten to fifteen years, and it's called the eco health approach and the eco social approach. Those approach basically um, they they talk about these diseases as complex systems where we have to consider not only like all the factors uh, that play a role but also their interaction. So for this, for example, um, I did my PhD dissertation on Chagas disease in Argentina, in northern Argentina. And this is a casual network of all the determinants that play a role in human infection. Don't worry about reading it because it's in Spanish. Um, I just didn't have time to translate, uh, and this is from my PhD dissertation. But basically, here, I'm displaying all the relevant uh, determinants and risk factors and how they play a role. And on the outside, we have the social determinants that will, they're, they're interrelated um, between each other, and they also inter interrelated with the ecological determinants. And this whole relationship, it's going to determine how people get infected. And after analyzing all the analysis that I did in my thesis, this is basically how we ended up uh, you don't have to worry about it, it's very intense. Uh, but basically, uh, what I did is to map all the difference, how the different um, factors are related to each other. The minus or plus um, talk about negative or positive interactions or effects 
And those are the ones that I had a hypothesis about it, but it, they didn't end up having uh, support, empirical support, and new other aspects that came out from the analysis. With all this information, what I did is turn this into a risk map. Uh, these maps are very useful for public health uh, because they can actually determine, especially in resource constrained areas, where to allocate uh, most of the resources for control. So based on the basic um, analysis from the basic science, we went to um, public health applications. So what I try to do uh, in my current research that I started here, I move into working with ticks and Lyme disease. So probably if you're from the area, you're familiar with ticks and have heard about Lyme disease. Um, and it's, but it's never been really or studied into like a social ecological system. So it's always been the, again, the natural system, uh, which is the natural transmission cycle on one side, it's been extensively studied, and also how humans get in contact with it, but we never, there are not many studies um, assessing the, how they, they are coupled. I mean, what are the processes that play a role, um, that how humans affect the natural system and how they feed back into um, human interaction with ticks. So basically what we're doing here is formalizing that causal network into uh, the couple of natural and human system framework, which talks about the dynamics within the natural system, the, dynamic, the dynamics within the human system, and what are the processes that link both systems. So to give you a brief introduction, so you have um, the ticks, that hatch into a larva in the summer. They feed on a host, and then on the second spring, the second year, they hatch into a nymph, they feed again, and they mold into adults, uh, and then they um, produce eggs in the following spring. So the life cycle is actually very complex, and it takes kind of uh, almost three years to complete. Um, on, this, on each of these stages, what happens is that um, the nymph or, well, the different stages the ticks can get infected and they can transmit it to humans. So how do we think about the transmission of Lyme disease um, as a couple of natural and human system? Well, on one hand, we have the exotic transmission cycle, which represents the environmental hazard. I mean, the density of infected nymphs. We call the, uh, the nymphs the most, um, risk stage for humans because they're small enough that people don't see them until they are engorged. Uh, adults are more easily to spot and um, remove before they actually can transmit the disease. And larvae, because when they hatch from eggs, they're not infected, um, then the risk is very low. But the nymphs can be really risky for humans. So the density of infected nymphs is a, a value of the hazard uh, for humans. So obviously the people can affect the natural transmission cycle by direct interventions on it, like spraying the backyards, for example, or controlling for deer. Uh, on the other hand, there are other, on another scale, people can also affect the transmission, uh, the natural transmission cycle by changes in land use, they can affect they can lead to habitat fragmentation, and that can change, um, they can produce changes in community composition of the host, the different hosts, and also affect uh, host movement that can affect the transmission. And obviously, uh, the natural transmission cycle is um, affecting the natural system by providing the um, em environmental hazard. And also because we're talking about people, people adapt to different situations, so we need to consider how the human adaptive behavior towards ticks. So here, one of the things I'm focusing on is how changes in land use leading to habitat fragmentation can lead to changes in the transmission of the disease. So here, for example, um, what we, our hypothesis is that through different from going from a forest to a high developed area like could be for example New York City there are different um, gradients of urbanization so you have suburban areas and you have kind of medium developed areas so the yellow area would be urbanized areas and the 
green areas would be the parks, for example. And in suburban areas, what is typical, especially in the Northeast, is that you have different houses embedded in a forest uh, matrix. So we hypothesis that within the gradient, the actually the process um, that I get the that are going to affect um, the transmission of the disease are going to be different. So, for example, in suburban areas, what we our hypothesis is that habitat fragmentation will have an effect mostly through changes in community composition, while in more urbanized areas, um, host mobility is going to be key. And also human risk, because we're talking about people, they're going to change depending on the gradient of urbanization. So the aims of my project are to actually assess the effect of the fragmentation on the environmental hazard, to also understand how this uh, habitat fragmentation and different uh, gradients of urbanization will affect human behavior uh, and the knowledge, attitudes, and practice towards uh, ticks that is going to affect human-tick interaction. And we are going to integrate this into um, an agent-based model to assess how does human change the environmental hazard and how it feedbacks into human exposure. Basically, what we're going to do is take uh, information from the first and second aim to develop simulation models. So we can actually model how the disease is being transmitted and also test different interventions. So we're conducting this study um, in Staten Island here in New York that represents a more urbanized area and in Block Island uh, in Rhode Island, which is an, an island that is uh, hyper endemic for Lyme disease and it's mostly um, very suburban type of area like you would see in Connecticut, for example, which this is the, the, the one that we're hoping maybe in the future we'll be studying, but we don't have the funds yet. So when I'm talking, when um, I'm referring to human behavior and tick exposure, is one of the things we want to answer is which activities increase the risk of exposure and where are people exposed to risk? And it could be in different places depending on their gradient of urbanization. Typically, this, is, this, has, this has been assessed through retrospective questionnaires. Uh, but those have a few problems. Um, they would ask people at the end of the summer what they've done, um, and it has a few, must, the main problem is that re the recall bias. People might not remember what they did, and there are a lot of uncertainties because people tend to forget what the, they did, and uh, and so it's hard to recall that. And also, there's a lot of limitation of external validity. What is true in one area not, is not necessarily true in another. So we're trying to assess this human behavior component by developing an app that it's going to be launched uh, in May this summer. Um, and it has basically a few um, surveys that are going to let us assess that. So on one hand, we have a baseline survey that it's aimed to capture the baseline risk factor of the people. And then we have uh, daily surveys that through the summer we ask people um, with a, for 15 days to ask at the end of the day what they did that day from a list of activities and if they found a tick on themselves. We also, during those 15 days, we asked them if we could track their um, location through the location services on the phone so we can actually uh, use that spatial data in coupled with the data from the surveys. And we're also offering some of um, services to the people that, for example, they can report a tick uh, if they find one. So we can actually tell them if it's a tick or not. And we have a lot of, um, we're just developing a lot of um, tick information material, which is educational material that will allow people to learn more about ticks, to how to identify them and what to do to prevent them. Uh, and with this, uh, the data that we get from this um, app well, we're going to try to basically assess, determine which are the activity patterns, what are the mobility patterns of the people, the typical mobility and activity patterns. And we're going to use that information uh, to design an agent or different type of agents with our people that we're going to simulate in a landscape in the agent-based model. For that, we're going to assess uh, the human take contact rate and the Lyme disease incidents at the local level. And 
If once we validate this model, it allowed us to test different um, interventions, uh, so we can use this as a tool for public health. And because we're interested in how this uh, ecological context affects um, changes, the risk perception and the activity, we're going to do this in like the different locations I mentioned. So this summer, actually, if you are willing to participate in our study and you're interested to know more about ticks, you will be able to download the app, which is called the Tick App. Um, we're currently developing it, and hopefully we'll have the uh, beta version next week. So we're really excited about it. Thank you. Um, sorry, and this is my contact information. So, uh, so we have time for a couple of questions, yes? Uh, one thing I should, two things I should have said in making introductory remarks is that the people you will see presenting are not everybody in the program. There's about three times as many postdocs as what you'll see. And some of them at the beginning of their studies and some towards the end. So you'll see presentations like this that are sort of getting, getting going and others that are more mature like Marin's is practically finished. 